Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship hosted here at the First Presbyterian Church of New Haven, Connecticut. It is good to gather as the people of God to worship God, even if our gathering is of our hearts and our spirits, while our bodies are apart. Now, before we join our voices together in the call to worship, I want to share with you a few announcements. First, it's that, yes, I do have crutches here with me. I sprained my ankle last weekend, and I'm well on the way to healing, um, but it's going to be a little while longer till I get rid of these guys. So they're very helpful for me to have at the moment, um, but I hope they don't become a distraction for you here in this worship service. Now, second, this is such a good announcement. It's an announcement of very good and faithful news. Many of you are aware that for the last several years, we have been prayerfully accompanying the membership of our neighbor church, the Church of the Redeemer. A little over a year ago, with God's help, the congregation decided to close the doors on that church and allow God's creative spirit to steward the gifts that they had given. Several members of that congregation have joined us here in ministry at First Presbyterian Church, and for their presence and their witness to Christ's active work in the world, we give thanks. Along with their presence, the faithful disciples of the Redeemer Church had physical resources to steward as well, like sacred objects, music. And each time we here at First Pres, now when we celebrate communion, we have a cup or a plate or a pitcher from the Redeemer Church on Christ's table here to celebrate the joyful feast, remembering the many paths that we take to come and be nourished by God's love. And our music library has expanded greatly. In fact, the anthem from last week, the 23rd Psalm, was made possible by the music of the Church of the Redeemer. Another generous gift that the Church of the Redeemer has brought into the life of this church is an unrestricted gift of $100,000. As they conveyed to us in a letter, this gift is evidence of their regard for First Presbyterian Church and its place in our shared community. Isn't that amazing? What God can do, isn't God amazing? In the coming year, the leadership of this congregation looks forward to dreaming and looks forward to dreaming with you. We look forward to dreaming about the ways that we might steward these gifts from God in meaningful and practical ways for, for our community, for the world around us. So stay tuned for more information about how you can participate in this dreaming process. And in the meantime, let us thank God over and over and over again. Let us thank God, thanking God for God's faithfulness to God's people in all times and places and thanks be to God for the community of the Church of the Redeemer. And finally, I want to draw your attention to our weekly email. I'm not going to go through any of those announcements just now, but we're entering into the holiday season, and there are several exciting opportunities that lay ahead of us. Please do take a moment to go back and read through, breeze through the weekly email to hear how you can participate in all of the celebrations that we have upcoming for the season of Advent. And of course, Christmas. You know, whether you're new to our community or you've been a part of us for a long time, you are welcome here at First Pres. You are encouraged to participate in any of the activities and ministries of the church. Information about all opportunities can be found in our weekly email, which is sent out every Thursday afternoon. Now, if you don't already receive that email, but you would like to, so that you can stay connected to these ministries, please send an email to office at fpcnh.org and we'll be sure to keep you up to date and included in all of our church-wide communications and activities. Now, you're invited to get comfortable, have a cup of tea or coffee or whatever else might make you feel more comfortable. Feel free to light a candle nearby, create a worshipful space near you, collect some flowers or sit in some warm sunlight I invite you now to join your heart with mine as we join our voices together in the call to worship. Come, all who are weary of wealth, of poverty, of power, of struggle, of division, 
Come, all who are heavy laden with too much, with too little, with anxiety, with fear, with anger. Come, all who have hope for liberation, for peace, for freedom, for the kingdom. Hear these words. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Come, let us worship God. God's generous creativity is beyond our imagining. Seemingly a step ahead of all of us, God's spirit flows free, bringing new life into every place. Like a beating heart, God's grace pulses through all of creation. And yet we often prefer a system of earning our way into God's favor. So as we prepare to hear God's word of grace for us this morning, let us approach God with honesty, with openness, confessing that which God's mercy may transform and redeem, trusting that all can be forgiven. First, we will pray in silence, and then together we will pray the prayer of confession as printed on your screen. Today we will have a responsive prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, when we resist your call to change our hearts from the ways of sin and evil, have mercy and help us to turn towards you again. Holy God, when we withhold forgiveness in poor attempt to nurse our wounded hearts, have mercy and help us to understand your grace. Holy God, when we close our hearts for fear of being vulnerable, have mercy and help us turn towards one another in love. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Hear this truth. We were made by God. We were brought forth from the earth, the earth that was called good when God created it. And from the depths of the earth, we have been knit together, wonderfully weight, wonderfully made. Our very being is good. Your very being is good. You are blessed and called forth to care for the earth and all who dwell in it. 
know that you are forgiven, that you are loved, that you are a child of God, God who makes all things new again. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our first scripture reading for this morning, it comes to us from the book of Proverbs once again. We're continuing our study, and today we'll round out chapter 4. So we're going to begin with the 10th verse of chapter 4, and we'll read through to the 27th. Let us listen for these words of wisdom. Hear my child, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble, for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what they stumble over. My child, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it the flow the for from it flow the springs of life put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you let your eyes look directly forwards and your gaze be straight before you keep straight the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure do not swerve to the right or to the left do not turn your foot for turn your foot away from evil. Thanks be to God for these words of wisdom. Now our second scripture reading for this morning, it's a little bit different than most of our readings. Our text for this morning begins with portions of chapter 36 of the book of Jeremiah. And then we go back to chapter 31 to read the second portion of the text. Now, when I first saw this, perhaps you may have experienced this too, I was a little bit surprised. It's not often that the lectionary passage, a passage that we read on a Sunday morning, instructs us to go back to front, but this one does. And so I did a little digging to understand why that was. You see, the book of Jeremiah that we have in our Bibles today, it's a composition of writings by and about the prophet Jeremiah. Editors were involved in piecing together the text that we have today, and they made judgment calls on how it's organized. The first 20, 25 chapters or so contain oracles of judgment, much of which is believed to be original to the prophet Jeremiah. Then the rest of the book, well, that contains narrative stories of the prophet, more oracles, some of judgment, some of hope, speeches concerning the prophets and speeches concerning the nations too. 
And what's important to note is that the editors of Jeremiah, they did not compile these stories and proph prophecies linearly. The book of Jeremiah is not a linear text. But our lectionary authors, however, they decided to structure the story according to a chronological timeline. So for our second reading this morning, we're going to begin with portions of chapter 36, and then we're going to flip back to chapter 31 so that we hear the story in chronological order. So let's get to it. I invite you to join, turn with me to chapter 36 of the book of Jeremiah. We'll read verses 1 through 8, and then 21 through 23, and then 27 and 28, and then we'll flip back to chapter 31, reading verses 31 to 34. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, with your word, set a seal upon our hearts. Make known to us your love. Amen. <clears throat> In the fourth year of King Je Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. It may be that when the house of Judah hears of all the disasters that I intend to do to them, all of them may turn from their evil ways so that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at Jeremiah's dictation all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah ordered Baruch, saying, quote, I am prevented from entering the house of the Lord, so you go yourself, and on a fast day, in the hearing of the people in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. You shall read them also in the hearing of all the people of Judah who come up from their towns. It may be that their plea will come before the Lord, and that all of them will turn from their evil ways. For great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against God's people. And Baruch, son of Neriah, did all that the prophet Jeremiah ordered him about reading the scroll, the words of the Lord, in the Lord's house. Then the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elishama, the secretary, and Jehudi read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. Now, the king was sitting in his winter apartment. It was in the ninth month, and there was a fire burning in the brazier before him. As Jehudi read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a penknife and throw them into the fire in the brazier until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the former words that were on the first scroll, which King Jehoiakim of Judah has burned. And now we go back to chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their spouse, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. 
for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our text today, which happens to be our final Old Testament text for this series, it's slightly different from the others that we've studied this fall. It has a bit of narrative rooted in history, and it concludes with an oracle of hope that sustains people of faith still today. So let's start from the beginning. The passage this morning opens up in a specific place in time. As indicated by the date described in the first verse, the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, the narrative begins at 605 BCE, more than 2,600 years ago. A word of the Lord comes to the prophet Jeremiah, and he turns to his trusted friend and secretary, Baruch, to have him write it down. Faithfully, Baruch does. He writes down the prophecy given to Jeremiah by God, oracles of judgment, imploring the people to turn from the ways of evil and to turn towards God, who is merciful. Jeremiah then instructs Baruch to take the written scroll and to go to the temple, to go and allow for all the people of Judah to hear the word that God has for them. And faithfully, Baruch goes and does as Jeremiah asks. He goes on his way, he takes out the scroll, he unfurls it from the spools, and he encourages the people to repent, to turn towards God, whose mercy and steadfast love endure forever. And he does this until a servant of the king, Jehudi, shows up. And Jehudi takes the scroll from Baruch, and Jehudi takes it back to the king, to read before the king and the king's entourage. He reads it aloud. And as the scroll unfurls with the words of God piercing the air in the room, the king takes a knife and he cuts the paper and he throws the severed pieces into the fire to watch them burn. Thinking that this is the end of the prophecy, that God would no longer have the ear of the people of Judah, King Jehoiakim is satisfied. But of course, God's word cannot be stopped. And God returns to Jeremiah and gives him the prophecy again. And Jeremiah has Baruch write it all down again. Then much like we experience in our own lifetimes, a lot changed in Judah over the course of the next 18 years. Between 605 BCE and 587 BCE, and a different method of communication was needed to share the word of God. You see, the second portion of our text for this morning, the portion from chapter 31, it's believed to have been written after 587 BCE, after the Babylonian exile. So while we're going back in the book, we're going to progress in time chronologically. When the foe from the north, the Babylonians, when they came into Jerusalem, the people of Israel were exiled. But Jeremiah decided to stay, stay in Jerusalem to help those who remained to rebuild their lives. In this time period, Jeremiah spoke oracles of hope, not judgment. And the second portion of our text this morning is one of those oracles of hope. Reflecting on the past and imagining a new future, God makes a new covenant with God's people about the way God will communicate with and this was not only a word of hope for the remnant of the Israelites who remained in Jerusalem. It is also a message of hope for us today as well. From the tablets of the Ten Commandments, to the scrolls dictated by Jeremiah and written by Baruch, to Gutenberg's printing press, to the internet that's bringing you this worship service today, the word of God is and always will be made known to God's people. Yes, indeed, this is very good news. Now, I don't know about your particular circumstance, but this has been, a, this has been, it will be, a difficult season for many of us. For those of us who have had to cancel Thanksgiving plans with family and friends, heartbreak and sadness really intermingle with the good and safe decisions. For those gatherings with 
gathering with loved ones, fear and worry intermingles with the gratitude and the gladness that we have in the gathering. Many of us feel weary from all the calculations about safety and risk, these calculations we have to make at every juncture of our lives right now. Many of us feel the heavy, heavy weight of mourning because of the sheer amount of death, illness, and isolation that plague our country and our world. Yet we know from our text this morning that no matter what, God's word will be made known. So people of faith, hear this word of hope from the prophet Jeremiah. God so desires to be known by us that God writes the letter, the love letter of a covenant upon our hearts, upon the involuntary muscle, this involuntary muscle that lives at the center of our very being, this involuntary muscle that sustains our lives. It does so without our will. It is upon this living muscle that God implants a deep knowing of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's hope. It has been with us from when we were knit together in the womb, and it will be with us until the moment we breathe our last breath in this life. God's word of love and mercy, it's not dependent upon our will to love God back, nor is it dependent upon our ability to read, our ability to accept, nor our ability to understand. It's not dependent upon our being positive or optimistic or ever hopeful all the time. God's word of love and mercy, it's not even dependent on others to convey the message to us. Though we know that it is extra special when it is experienced in community. But God's covenant is written upon our hearts to help us know in our inner being the indisputable knowledge that God's grace and mercy, that God's presence and love, that God's hope and peace, it's for us as individuals. It's for us as God's people. God's grace and mercy, God's presence and love, God's hope and peace, it is always with us, beating quietly, giving us life. God is our God, and we are God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us hold a moment of silence. I want to introduce you to someone relatively new to our community, uh, someone who has been working with our youth, Tori. Tori Crook is going is a student at the Yale Divinity School, and she is a student intern with the Oasis Youth Group. So she has been working with Kimberly and the other leaders of the various churches that are involved in this federated youth group, and we are so grateful for the ministry that Tori is bringing in and among us. And today she is inviting us to join our hearts with hers as together we pray for the people. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, this is a time of love and of grief. We know you hold us in your hand and that you experience these joys and sorrows with us. We thank you for the new and creative ways in which we find community and love each day. 
We give thanks to all the healthcare and essential workers who continue to work tirelessly for their communities. We pray you hold your steadfast, steadfast hand with us as we watch COVID cases rise again in our communities and that we can work together for the safety and betterment of each other. We grieve those whose holidays plans have strayed from their family traditions for the sake of health and safety and love. We pray for safety for those who are traveling during this time and for each and every person that has to give up time with their families and loved ones. We long for normalcy, but you remind us that our normal is not always loving and fruitful for our neighbors. We pray that we find love with our communities as we begin to see the end of 2020, that we find practices for ourselves and for each other that work towards your goodness. Whether this is mutual aid in kindness, in food, work, art, play, or prayer. We know you sit in the center of it all with us. We give thanks for the whales whose very lives funded the building of so much of New England. Grant us the wisdom, awareness, and integrity to protect the North Atlantic right whales from extinction. Remember your servant, our friend Carla Cole, and all the people in Nicaragua, Honduras, and Central America as they try to recover from two massive storms. We remember that the holiday we celebrate of Thanksgiving is not only a time of gathering and graciousness, but also marks a tragedy for our indigenous siblings who were removed from their lands and still suffer greatly from the remnants of colonization. We pray for reconciliation, reparations, and healing that may begin with us. We pray for guidance and navigating hard conversations around the dinner table, hearts that are open to grace and kindness and strength to stand for what we believe is right. God, you are on the side of goodness and love and justice. God, you stand with us in the midst of chaos and you stand with us in the moments of silence. We are thankful for sunny days and cooler weather to remind us that the seasons do change. And in your graciousness, we thank you and pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, in your holy name. Amen. It is our proclamation that God is indeed at work among us, in us, that God is with us, ushering us towards well-being, ushering the whole world 
towards healing, wholeness, and restoration. The act of giving an offering is our participation. It's an expression of our commitment that we as individuals and we as a community are a part of the redeeming and resurrecting ministry of Jesus Christ that is alive and active in the world today. To give, you can visit the church website. You can click the link, the My Gift to Give link that was in the email, the worship email where you got this link. Or you can text the number that will appear there at the bottom of your screen. However you give, we ask that you give generously to the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ at work in the world. Through our giving, we boldly declare that our God is a God of presence, a God of love, a God of mercy and grace. A God is our God of peace, and our God is still creating, still leading all of humanity towards life abundant. Our morning offering will now be received. these gifts, O oh God, these gifts from the Church of the Redeemer, these gifts that are brought before you in this moment, for all these gifts, O oh God, we return to you with love. We pray that you might grant us wisdom, grant us imagination and intelligence and energy and love that we might be good stewards of these good gifts in your name. In your Holy Son's name we pray. Amen. Church, as we conclude this service, but go out into the world to live our worship, I invite you first to stop and check your pulse. Feel that beating heart. Know that upon that heart, God has written God's word upon it that you are loved, that you are forgiven. You are a child of God. So go out into the world. Go out into the world with our grace, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>